Hey, man, it's me, Kevin Smith. Are you listening to the right podcast? Because you're supposed to be listening to Three Guys in a Flick. Are you listening to that right now? Then you're in the right place. Enjoy. Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. The show is about to begin. Remember, kid, there's heroes and there's legends. Heroes get remembered, but legends never die. Follow your heart, kid. You'll never go wrong. Three guys and a flick with Don, Ken, and John. Dive into the movies well after the dawn. From the good to the bad to the wildly absurd. They give a fuck about films. Their voices are heard. Welcome back. You are listening to Three Guys in a Flick. This is where we review the good, the bad, and the absurd. Tonight's episode, The Sandlot. Beware spoilers coming to you from well the sandlot my name is don and to my right we have the comic book guy john how you doing i'm good how are you i'm ready to go play throw (laughs) of course you are you were just waiting for that (laughs) and to my left we have the professor ken hello everybody joining us tonight is a longtime listener and fan this is angus Hey, is that your sister out there in left field, naked? <laughs> Think she'd go out with me? <laughs> Tonight we are talking about the Sandlot. The Sandlot comes to us via the Bronco helmet and was submitted to us by Angus. And so I have to ask the question, Angus, why the Sandlot? Uh, yeah, I guess just because I grew up playing baseball and grew up watching this movie. But it's simply this movie is everything I'm not and everything I am. Shout out to Kanye. (laughs) Did you just shout out Kanye? Absolutely. (laughs) Angus was gracious enough to join us for the podcast. Uh, My son, Keenan, who was on the podcast, kept asking me over and over again, have you talked to Angus? Have you talked to Angus? And um, so thank you for coming on to the show. Thanks for having me. Yeah, we hope you have a good time. The first time you approached Angus about coming on the show and doing it, what was his response? He was like, oh, no, man, I can't do it. And it was actually uh, at Keenan's bachelor party. He pulls me aside. And do you remember what we talked about? Uh, I believe we talked about the Batman. Absolutely. And there you go. Released on April 7th, 1993, The Sandlot was directed by David Mikey Evans. Screenplay by David Mikey Evans and Robert Gunter. And it stars Tom Geary, Mike Vitar, Patrick Renna, Chauncey Lapardi, Marty York, Brandon Adams, Grant Gelt, Shane Obadinsky, Victor DeMadia, Dennis Leary, Karen Allen, Darth Vader, and a bunch of other neighborhood kids. How'd this movie do, Don? This movie was made for $7 million and brought in $34 million. It's not too bad. Silly question, but I'm going to ask it anyway. John, had you seen The Sandlot? I had not seen this movie. And as soon as I said silly question, I thought to myself, why would John see this movie? But hang on. I'll come back to you. Uh, Professor, obviously. Yeah, a bunch of times. Yeah. And of course, you love it, right? Oh, yeah. 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 Put it in the helmet. Countless. Yeah. Countless How about you, Don? Uh, yes, many times. Uh, let's go back to you. That was the first time you'd seen it? It is the first time I'd seen it. I obviously, growing up, was not big into sports movies, but my brother was complete opposite, so I'm sure he's seen it thousands of times. Oh, okay. okay. His favorite movie is Bull Durham and uh, Field of Dreams. Uh, both Kevin Costner vehicles and both very respectable. Uh, on a side note, I think the listeners know my feelings on baseball. And I think uh, everybody at this table knows my feelings on baseball, so I'm not going to get into it. Well, that's why I was, I, a, I was a little shocked that you picked this movie, but you did it because of your love for Angus. Well, yeah, well, Angus submitted it, and he wanted to come on the show, and, you know, here he is. So, of course, I, of course I picked it. Half yeah. the reason I submitted it is because I know Don's feelings about baseball. Oh, see? <laughs> this, this kid gets me, all right? Mm-hmm. He gets me. And it's funny that you say that because Bull Durham is actually my favorite baseball movie. And I would say that the Sandlot is probably like my third. So, you have another one you like? Fever Pitch. All right. With Fallon and yeah, Barrymore. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. 
Do you have a favorite sports movie overall? I was thinking about that on my drive home, and the first thing that popped into my mind was Remember the Titans. What about you, Professor? Probably Bull Durham. That's solid choice. Solid choice. Angus? Um, I would say, I mean, Sandlot's in my top three. Um, I think Hoosiers is up there. Yeah? Yeah, Hoosiers or Friday Night Lights would be another one. Friday Night Lights is good, but my biggest problem with Friday Night Lights is they don't fucking win. Yeah, it's tough. And, and it's a real part of life, right? right? I mean, come on. Yeah. But I like a happy ending. Therefore, remember the Titans. You're a Hall of Famer in my book, Coach. What's yours? Uh, well, of course, mine. Uh, I would have to say the original Bad News Bears. Oh, that's a good choice. Oh, nice. Yeah, good one. So David Mikey Evans directs this thing, and he's also the narrator of this thing. Uh, would you guys think of him as the narrator? I loved him. Did you? Yeah, he sounded great. Oh, took me out of it. Mainly because the guy who plays him, or the guy who plays older Scotty, Arliss Harris, I've seen him in a bunch of stuff, and I know what his voice sounds like, and it didn't match what was going on, so it completely took him, took me out of it. But I don't know. I didn't like it. What did what'd you think? Well, I guess the original plan was to have Robin Williams do it, but he was unable for whatever reason. Uh, I don't know if to me... When I first heard his voice and I first heard him narrating, I got Wonder Years vibes. Oh, sure. I could see that. I could see that. What about you? Uh, I, I thought it was great. Um, I would have liked Robin Williams as well. He might have been doing Flubber at the time. <laughs> Flubber. <laughs> but, uh, no, I thought it fit. Yeah. Okay. Right on. Right on. Uh, are you guys familiar with any of the director's other work? I had to look it up because I had not heard of him before. So, no, you have not. Uh, well, when I looked at the list, now I'm familiar with some of his stuff, but uh, I wouldn't have known he had directed him. Yeah, what about you? No, he, he's somebody who's unknown to me. What about you? Nothing? Nope. All right, what did he direct there, guy? Uh, he did Sandlot, First Kid, which I had heard of. Uh, Sin, uh, classic Sinbad yeah. vehicle. Uh, my Teacher, My Friend. Sounds like a porn. Beethoven's Third. Yep, and, saw that one. And Fourth. Beethoven's Fourth. National Lampoon's Barely Legal. So I think it's funny. He goes from doing like kids' movies to all of a sudden a National Lampoon's movie. Uh, my Teacher, My Friend 2, Wilder Days, uh, The Sandlot 2, The Final Season, Ace Ventura Jr. Pet Detective, Tranced, Glass and Berry, Isle of Light, and Smitty. But he's probably most well known for Radio Flyer. Oh, I didn't know he did Radio Flyer. I don't think I've ever seen Radio Flyer. Saw it once, VHS, long, long time, time ago. ago. Yeah. yeah. Was it a spinoff of Ace Ventura that he did? The, the Yeah, it was Junior when they brought in the kid to play him. It was supposed to be like Ace Ventura's kid. I don't think I ever saw that. Or you, was it? You don't need to. Okay, it, I didn't think so. <laughs> it had a kid that looked like Chunk from... Uh, oh. from uh, Goonies. Goonies. Goonies, yeah. Oh, looked, yeah. Kind of like him. Oh, right. Sloth love Chunk. Mm-hmm. This movie has a bunch of unknown actors. What did you guys think of the kids? Well, originally they wanted like eight and nine-year-olds, but then they figured it would be too difficult to find kids who could actually act the parts. So then they went with the older kids. I think they're now, they're like 12 and 13. Uh, I thought they did okay. I mean, for what you would expect to get out of kids that age, it, it just felt okay to me. Were you looking for fucking Gone with the Wind? No, I was looking for like maybe Stand By Me kind of acting or like oh. one or two kids to really just stand up. And I did think that Smalls was okay. I thought the guy who played Benny was really good. I liked him. Yeah. Um, and then, uh, I don't know, was was his name Spectacles or what was his name? Squints. 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 Palidorus. He kind of stood out a bit. But other than that, nobody else really kind of stood out to me. Huh. What about you there, guy? Oh, I, I liked the kids. I thought they were great. Uh, I, I thought that it, it was a nice wide swath of kids, you know, having a, a tall kid, having, a, you know, a chunkier kid. And I, I thought that they were uh, they were a lot of fun to watch. And the uh, the dialogue that they had, the smack talk that went back and forth all the time, delightful. Ham and his uh, narration, you know, not his narration, but, you know, just his his mouth, just the way he talks to other people is just so damn funny. Yeah, I agree. I I think that the uh, the Scotty Smalls. I thought that he was a great awkward kid that was entirely unsure of himself, and so it was fun to watch him on his journey. Yeah, 
I agree. I agree. Yeah, I, I I think it's a great cast of characters. Um, to echo their points, I thought Benny was really good. Um, he kind of plays that charismatic leader that uh, every sports movie needs. Yep, he's our hero. Yep, yeah. he's our hero. Um, but uh, my favorite is has got to be Ham Porter. Um, just the constant shit talk. Um, he kind of steps up as he's almost like the number two. Oh yeah, um, you know, um, he was just. Yeah, hilarious. So. Yeah, I, I enjoyed him as well. I have expected the way that they kind of had Benny, the character he was playing, and he was almost like the perfect kid, uh, that we were going to get one of those kind of stand-by-me type endings where, you know, Benny went, got drafted into the war and got killed and never came home. You know, it's just some tragic ending for Benny like that, that he never got to play baseball. All right, so hang on. Let me back this up for two seconds. You thought at the end of this fun adventure summer tale of being a kid tree houses contraptions all of that would end in tragedy possibly yeah oh wow what what has the, the world, world done to you my friend i kicked me in the balls too oh my god times. this movie couldn't have ended any better mm-hmm. you, in, sh- you need to spend some time and watch my girl that's what you should watch <laughs> oh i have seen that movie oh, we're gonna punish this guy aren't we yeah that's a kick in the sack yeah you know who they underused, I think, in this movie? Oh, please, enlighten me. Dennis Leary. I'm actually a fan of Dennis Leary, especially his comedy. And if you ever are interested in seeing one of his best comedy, one of the best stand-up comedy routines out there is No Cure for Cancer by Den- Dennis Leary. He even wrote a book on it, and it's just fantastic. Um, but they gave him with like two or three lines in the whole movie. Yeah, he was a typical 1962 dad. Yeah. To the to the part of the hair, to the his wonderful instructions on how to play how to play catch. Uh, how to play throw. Watch the ball. Just watch the ball. Don't do anything else. Just watch the ball. Right. I thought he nailed it as what it was. Well they couldn't and, and well and any and I think anything more would have just been a little bit too much because the movie was about the kids. Mm-hmm. And you know what I mean? But so. I mean they could have used any other actor for that role. But you why, Dennis? Like, but if, Dennis Leary knocks it out of the park. I don't know. I think just anybody could have knocked it out of the park. Dennis Leary plays such a great sarcastic character. I just felt they underused him. Yeah, he, but that's not what the story needed. You needed somebody who was intimidating to to Scotty, and that intimidation came across in space. <laughs> this guy wants gone with the win. I fucking love it, well, sir. You got to watch out for that curve. There's a good <laughs> porn it, name. Yeah. Well. <laughs> <laughs> There you go. Uh, my favorite is when he uh, comes in and takes a uh, block of meat. <laughs> he just slaps of meat it on his, throws it. On his head. Yeah. So 1962, Dad. So Such a good job. Uh, Karen Allen, Marion. What would you guys think of her as the mom? I honestly didn't realize she did anything else besides Indiana Jones. So oh, it was kind of nice to see her. Yeah. I thought she did good. Yeah. She was good. She was what the story needed her to be. And I bought them as a family unit, which helps. So... I wish I had a mob who told me, go out and get in trouble. You know, not a lot of trouble, but go ahead and get in some trouble. Did your mom ever shame you for being a nerd? No, she really appreciated that. Oh, good. See, this mom, 1962 mom, she shames the kid. (laughs) Go out and do something, you fucking nerd. Don't get dirty. (laughs) I mean, kids these days, I feel like, would be confused by this movie because... They don't go outside and play like we did all day. Yeah, no, I I would agree with that. However, I will say... uh, Logan and Elise, they appreciate the movie. So that's good. I guess the term these days for kids who go outside and do things are free-ranged kids. That makes sense. So, Well, my kids, they love the movie. They've seen it a bunch of times. It is a classic. James Earl Jones, the man. What do you guys think of his performance in this? Ken. It was such a surprise the first time I saw the movie. Oh, shit, they got James Earl Jones. This is awesome. Yeah. And uh, he... He delivers very well. I I love every time I uh, watch him talk about baseball being life and and how and how he would crowd the plate. That that whole dialogue when he's talking to Danny and Scotty, just I mean, he it's so good. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Uh, yeah, he's obviously fantastic. Um, I had a couple thoughts uh, when I was rewatching yesterday um, when he came into the movie was. Um, well, you look at the backyard and then you 
find out he's a blind man. Um, and you're thinking to yourself, well, that's definitely a blind guy's backyard. Um, the other thing um, was, and I don't know if any of you guys were thinking the same thing, was I've always wanted to know what Darth Vader's backyard looked like. <laughs> now you know. Now you know. Yeah. What confused me about the backyard, because he was blind, who's running around picking up the shit? Shouldn't all of those balls be landing in shit? Because there was no shit in there. No shit. <laughs> I think the dog was eating his own shit. Oh, that's. I guess that's a good point. I had never thought about the mystery of the shit. <laughs> and why would you, right? Because his performance, James Earl Jones, was, I loved it. That's probably my favorite scene in the movie is the reveal and then when he brings Benny and Scotty in to talk to him and just mm -hmm. just that whole bit. And you're right, how excited he gets. And not a fan of baseball, but I'm a fan of sports. And there is a love you have for sports, regardless of what it is, that's undying. And the fact that he still feels that, even though it dealt him a raw deal and this, that, and the other, I thought he just was fantastic one thing i really liked about this movie is uh they really threw us a curveball when james Earl jones appeared because if you remember in the flashbacks where they show the beast growing up and all that they showed the junkyard owner as some short white fat guy who was kind of running around in a tank top and everything and so that's what i was expecting when they got to the end they were going to find that guy living there so then you get james Earl jones and the moment you hear his voice, I don't know, something about him, no matter what role he's in, just brings a smile to your face. Because he's Darth Vader. Yeah. Am I right? Yes. Am I right? Absolutely. Okay, there you go. We feel it, bud. Mm -hmm. We feel it. Hey, Don, ready to play ball? Uh, Why, well, yes, boys. I can play some ball. Welcome to another edition of Master Movie Trivia. I am your reigning champ. You may call me the champ. I have compiled five questions and five questions only to test your knowledge of the movie we are reviewing. Each question could be worth multiple points, so if you know the answer, say it. And please wait until I finish each question. And Angus, you are more than welcome to play as well. He's a ringer on this one. He knows the movie backwards and forwards. I suck at ass at trivia. <sighs> it's the pressure. Yeah. Question number one. According to Benny, who runs like a duck? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Look at that. Two-way tie. Very good. I love it. Question number two. What was the name of the beast? Hercules. Hercules. <laughs> Hercules. Hercules. Question number three. What kind of shoes does Benny wear to get in a pickle with the P beast? P.F. Flyers. Oh, nice. Which I guess the story is, is that that caused a resurgence. They brought him back after this movie. They became popular again. Yeah. yeah. Question number four. At the end of the movie, how do the characters' lives end up? You want each one? Yeah, that's the question. Well, Smalls becomes a, a baseball announcer. Benny goes on to play for the Dodgers, I think. That's two. Uh, Britt Tram gets lost in the 60s. I love it. Timmy and Tommy become an architect. Ham a, becomes the great Hambo. And a contractor. Uh, you got nothing? They got me. Squints, He's a wrestler. Oh, they got Squints me. Squints married Wendy Peppercorn. And he works at the drugstore that they own, and they have nine children. And Scotty Smalls is a sports announcer. Yeah. Did we get Kenny? No, we did not get Kenny. Whoever gets Kenny gets the point. Kenny. Oh, he, he owns his own businesses, and he's a little league coach. Nice did, professor. Did you do Tom and Tommy? Or he did. Yeah, that they invented bungee cord. Yeah. What's the no, name? No, of? yeah, yeah, invented the bungee cord. Oh. Yeah. What's the name of Kenny's kids' team? The Heaters. There you go. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I got gotcha. you. I got gotcha. you. Well done. I'm going to give that to you, professor. Coming through. And question number five. What team is considered Murder's Row? 1927 New, New York, York Yankees. Yankees. There you go. I'm going to give that one to our guest. Well done, boys. None of you are any closer to movie immortality. In the late spring of 1962, fifth grader Scott Smalls moves to the San Fernando Valley right outside Los Angeles with his widowed mother and recent stepfather, Bill. As school ends and summer begins, Smalls' mother encourages him to make friends and he tries to join a group of boys who play baseball daily at the neighborhood sandlot. 
brothers Timmy and Tommy Timmons, Michael Squints Palladoris, Alan Yaya McLennan, Bertram Grover Weeks, pitcher Kenny DeNunez, catcher Hamilton Ham Porter, and their leader and best player, Benny Rodriguez. Everybody but Benny laughs at Small's lack of ability and, in an attempt to play catch with his stepdad, Bill, injures Smalls and leaves him with a black eye. Nevertheless, Benny invites him onto the team and helps him improve his skills and earns the boys' respect. So this movie opens up with yet another narration. I mean, that should be a trivia question. Um, what did you guys think of the opening of this movie? I thought it worked well. You know, it, it tells us that we're going to go back in time to uh, a one fateful summer that he says is the best summer of his life. It gave me Stand By Me vibes. It gave me kind of TV movie vibes. It, it kind of felt like just about every kid's movie came out, you know, that year or around that time. Yeah, I thought it was great. Um, you see Smalls kind of as the loner with, with no friends. Uh I think Benny does a great job of kind of picking him up and playing that hero role. Yeah. And you see it right away. Yeah. And so after the narration, we meet Scott at this age, I guess, or whatever, and we go back in time. And you're right. It did give me Stand By Me vibes, but that's okay because I love Stand By Me. Mm -hmm. So those were good vibes. And we meet Mom and Stepdad Bill. I like how he refers to him sometimes as Dad. I mean, Bill... Bill, I mean, Dad, you know, he does it, 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 he does it several times like that awkwardly. Yeah, and he tells us, the audience, that he had a heck of a fifth grade and he just moved. And the line that kind of made me go, oh, was I didn't have a single friend in a thousand miles and or in this state or you whatever. You totally know how a kid like that's got to be feeling. Yeah, yeah. Well, what first really kind of hit me with this opening is, uh, as some listeners know, I'm a stepdad. And I know that awkward feeling between a stepdad and a stepson. You know, it takes a little while to adjust to what do you call them? You know, what is your relationship going to be? You know, if it's a father. In this case, she's a widower, but, you know, is the father still in the picture? So you don't want to play too much of the father role. So you don't want to get, you know, too much over them. And you don't know when's the right time. So it's a lot of awkwardness. So I understood that awkwardness. And then really right away, like you were saying, you're grabbed by the fact that this kid feels alone. He has no friends. He's kind of an egghead, so he's a little bit of a nerd. Um, and it seems like, you know, kind of bring up real quick, all the kids in the neighborhood are all baseball players, and you know this kid knows nothing about baseball. As they're unpacking and he's unloading the U-Haul, he looks over and he sees Benny running off, and so, you know, he's curious. And so the next day... Before they get to the uh, field... I like the introduction we get of Bill because when we first see Bill and Scotty talking to each other, Scotty's looking at Bill and Bill isn't looking at Scotty. He's looking at his, his precious uh, baseball memorabilia that he's carefully setting up. And so clearly his focus is not on Scotty. And so right off the bat, I can tell that Bill is not used to being a dad just as much as Scotty is not used to having Bill be his new dad. Sure. And sure. so I thought that that, was, that that was a good way to show the isolation that Scotty has with himself and how important it is that mom comes in and tells him not to spend yet another summer later on right. in the bedroom. Yep. This You also bring up the point about the ball. I feel like this is our first introduction to what I was going to call the uh, the movie Trinity of this, the foreshadowing Trinity. There's three items I feel like they bring up constantly throughout this movie to tell you that these are the three things that are going to make a major impact at the end of the movie. The first is the ball. The second is the beast. And the third is pickle. Playing oh. pickle. Because they constantly bring up all three many times during the movie. So that's how, right away, I figured that's how the movie has to end with those three. Did you know what a pickle was? Yeah, playing pickle. Yeah. Where you get the guy trapped between two players. Yeah. yeah. I was just curious. And so we find out that uh, Scotty has a plastic glove that his grandma bought him. And one of those shiny ones, too. I think I had one of those. That doesn't surprise me <laughs> at all. And you he. Like it? Oh. And he builds up the courage to, you know, he wants to ask Bill to teach him how to play catch. Did you like his fisherman's hat? 
the baseline. Oh, yeah, that, that was nice. With a long bill. Yeah, yeah. Um, but he runs out to the field, right? And then that's when well, he, he sees the kids, and, and he's, he's like, oh, what's right going back. on? Yeah, and, and he, Benny hits the ball. He did say that he had followed the kids one day and saw that they all went to this baseball lot. Oh, right, that's, that's what it was. And he kind of sees what's going on, and he knows he doesn't, he knows he can't play, but he, uh, they tell him to throw the ball back to him and well, he gets clobbered by the ball. Oh, that's true. Or it, yeah, it knocks him over. My yeah. dad who was watching the movie with me. He loves sports movies. He's just like my brother. Uh, and his first response was, you don't put him in, you put him in right field. Cause the ball never goes to right field. That's where we put all the kids who couldn't play. <laughs> and John was sitting there and went, Wait. No. <laughs> Whenever I played. I played right field. Whenever you played I played. right field? No. no. Yeah. no. <laughs> He's like, no. I was always in right field. That's where I went because the ball rarely ever came there. Yeah, well, there you go. He throws the ball back <laughs> in such a pathetic way. Which was funny because the kid actually could throw a ball. He had to uh, learn how not to throw a ball. I guess his little league coach was very disappointed. Yeah. And so he goes home and then he wants to play or he wants to learn how to play catch. And this is the bit where Bill and him start playing catch. And this this whole bit was kind of just cringy to watch. And what was cringy to watch about it for me was every time the ball would go past him, he would always go, oh, oh sorry, sorry. Uh, I'm sorry. Always apologizing. And Bill's look when Scotty runs the ball back to him. <laughs> this, Instead of throwing it. This is my kid. Yeah. I guess uh, the director sent the kids to like two or three week baseball camp. Yeah. To get ready for this movie. I kind of think that Bill threw the curve on purpose and hit the bullseye. Well, yeah. He, he didn't wanted want, to go back to work. Yeah. He didn't want to play no more. No. And he was pissed that the mom guilted him into doing it in the first yeah. place. So good old 1962. He knew what he was doing. He knew yeah. what he was doing. Stepdads don't have to be nice. The next day, Scotty's sitting on the porch. just And Benny shows up. God bless Benny, right? That was, he was the fucking man. He was a good kid. Yeah, he he really was, and probably one of my favorite characters in this movie. Mm-hmm. Why but, wouldn't he be? Yeah, he's so good. He he comes up and he says, "Hey man, what are you doing? Let's go play some ball." And Smalls is just making up excuses, right? My mitts broke. I can't. Here, you can use my mitt. And yes, the jet has a fucking backup. And so what we get out of this is we realize now that Benny, he didn't laugh yesterday at the field when Smalls humiliates himself, and he comes right back the next day that Benny is going to be the champion that we uh, expect him to be throughout the entire movie because he is such an upstanding person. Right, and this is this bit is probably another one of my favorite scenes because... Yeah, Smalls goes out there, and he Benny tells him, hey, we got this makes nine. We can have a full game, and he's trying to talk the guys into it, and they're like, nah, this guy's a fucking geek, whatever. But Benny holds true, and I like the bit. He goes, left center. Is that where you put him? Yeah, left yeah. center. But he didn't know where left center was, yeah. so he had to show him. So it's you, over there, man. You, you know this isn't going to go well for Smalls. He's fucked. Well, yeah. I, just, I like the, where he goes, I, I don't know how to catch. How do I catch? Yeah, just put your arm out and I'll do the rest of it. Yeah, that, that's a great line. And it just kind of shows that Benny knew what he was doing. And so they go out and they start practicing this, that, and the other, and they hit it to Smalls, and he picks it up, and he runs it back to him <laughs> because he can't throw Painful, it. painful. Yeah. And then... Uh, the look on Kenny's face. Yeah. Like, what the fuck? In that scene, he's like, are you fucking serious? Yeah. And so Smalls wants to give up and go home and, you know, and the the boys are talking shit, you know, who is this guy? And here comes Benny, sticks up for Smalls, being the new kid. Benny has a heart, and he tells the kids, you know, you guys were all fucking no good too, but we practiced and we worked it out, so he's just going to join us, and that is what it is. And... From that moment, the bond between those nine was getting stronger, Mm -hmm. you know. So, and it was all held together through Benny. My favorite part of that whole thing 
was, you know, after he catches the ball and the team then also accepts him, is the walk home when Benny tells him, you know, next time wear some jeans and get rid of that hat. And he goes, like, I don't have another hat. Benny just happens to have a hat for him. Yeah, well, Benny was the man. And that, that to me, actually moved me a bit for him to give him that hat. Oh. I expected in the very end when they, you knew that they were going to do a grown-up adult scene, I thought he would be wearing that hat at the end. Oh. Yeah. And, you know, it, it was a good, satisfying day because, you know, he catches that ball and then he throws the ball to second the way that he's supposed to. And everybody instantly, all right, yeah, he's okay. He can play. Yeah. I thought it was a piece of good acting, the scene you just described. Um, well, he, he asked if he has a fireplace. Burn it. Um, and he goes, yeah, looks looks to his left and right. Yeah, throw that in there, man. Yeah. The only thing I wish we would have gotten to see, and it might have just added too much time to the movie, is him learning to hit the ball. Because I think that could have been comedy gold to see some of that experience. During these times, we do get little sprinkles of the beast growling and the fence shaking a little bit so, right behind smalls yeah so we're, we're beginning to realize that there is a growing story there that's going to be revealing itself sometime later yes When Ham hits a home run into the adjacent backyard, the team is dismayed. However, they stop Smalls from retrieving the ball and tell him of the Beast, a legendary fearsome English Mastiff living behind the fence. According to Squints, in 1942, Mr. Myrtle, the owner of the property, bought a young dog and it grew increasingly big and vicious until Mr. Myrtle received a summons to keep the Beast chained up. In the year since, Many baseballs have gone over the fence. All have been claimed by the beast. I love the list that we have Scotty putting together about things that he needs to learn about things that he needs to know about. And number one on the list is the great Bambino. Right. And we do get a little sprinkling of that earlier on when uh, Smalls is introduced to the group and they're talking and then, Who's, who's the great Bambino? You know, the Sultan of Swat. They're all giving him shit about it, yep. and he and he does what any kid would do and go, oh, oh, yeah, oh yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I thought you yeah. said the great Bambi. Yeah. That wimpy deer. <laughs> That's right. And so Ham hits the fucking homer. and They're all pissed off because they can't play anymore. They're like, oh, it's only 12 o'clock, you know, blah, blah, blah. And Smalls, he starts climbing the fence. And they're like, stop! And Smalls is like, why? I'll, I'll fucking go get it. I don't give a fuck. And all in unison... The, the beast. beast. And then he's like, who the fuck is the beast? Camp, Camp out. out. I thought it was interesting. I don't know. It kind of bothered me a little. That here's this kid playing against the fence, you know, for the whole movie so far. And he's been hearing the growling and kind of seeing the shadow of this dog. And, you know, you think looking through that hole, that huge hole that was in the fence, he'd be able to see what was going on in there. He would already know that there's this big, huge dog in there. Yeah, well, he's... 11 or 12 years old, who knows? I don't know what to tell you. What did you guys think of the whole camp out scene in the tree fort? We get our first, you're killing me, Smalls, when Ham offers the uh, s'mores. Some of the best dialogue and writing of this entire flick. I felt like a little bit of a who's on first. Because, uh, kind of, yeah. Uh, yeah, you want a s'more? S'more or of what? what? I haven't had anything yet, so yeah. how could I ask more if I haven't had anything yet? <laughs> right. You're killing me, Smalls. Julie, that is one of her favorite lines. She had never even seen the movie, but every time like I would do something, which is a lot, you know, I'd do something stupid, she'd always say, you're killing me, Smalls. Yeah, well, I mean, I got classic lots, line. I got lots of lines that are, are part of my family's household. It's part of our regular vernacular, you know, little tidbits from this movie. Sure. You're killing me, Smalls. Uh, to students, I will always say, forever. <laughs> <laughs> and I've only had one student recognize it. No shit. Yeah. It was one of the Ross kids. Hey, that's from the Sandlot. Oh, that's funny. Angus, do you use any of the lines? Uh, Quite a few of them. Yeah, I know. You're killing me, Smalls. has got to be the most popular. Um, Another one I say is, uh, my clothes are going out of style. Yeah. Yeah. L7 weenie. Oh, yep. yeah. Square. Yep. Yeah. What is that from? Well, is that from the baseball diamond? or I? No. I, Make an L 
Well, I understand an L, but what's an L? L now, seven square. Yes, it makes a square if you okay. put an L and a seven together. Okay. I just never, square. I knew the L and stuff, but I just didn't know that I'd never heard it referred to as an L7 then square. Yeah. 1962. What are you going to do? And so at the camp out, we get the tale of the beast. Squints tells, regales us with the story, the history of the beast. First of all, that was a hell of a tree house. I like that tree house. That was a really nice tree house. And that's why I wondered later on, they talk about, I think, the two Toms or whatever. Tim and Tommy. Tim and Tommy. They become uh, architects. I wonder if they built that treehouse. Because it was a freaking nice-ass treehouse. I want to think knows? that was their backyard. You think so? I think They so. lived in the back of the sandlot? Yep. Yeah. Possibly. Possibly. I got a little teary-eyed when they kind of blew the shit up. Well, they just kind of blew up the vacuums. Mm-hmm. But funny nonetheless. We'll get there. We'll get there. One particular hot day, the team opts to go swimming at the neighborhood pool in lieu of baseball. While there, Squint fakes drowning to receive mouth-to-mouth resuscitation from lifeguard Wendy Peppercorn, with whom he has had a crush. He kisses her, and she kicks the boys out. But as they leave, Wendy waves at Squints with a warm smile. The team plays a 4th of July night game by the lights of the fireworks, and Smalls observes that, to Benny, baseball was life. They later play against a snooty rival Little League team and win. They later celebrate at a fair with a combination of chewing tobacco attained by Bertram and riding the Trabant, causing Ham to vomit on himself. So we get a scene where Squints and Yaya, they come out of the store and we are introduced to Wendy Peppercorn and she's doing the slow motion walk to her. Yeah. And clearly... (laughs) Somebody's Twitter pated. Well, I think all of them are, but we're definitely focused on Squints. Well, I love how Squints is like, okay, everybody stop. And he just stares. Yeah. And even Yeah Yeah has a moment and then he comes back down to earth. So back at the sign lot, they're like, man, we've been waiting forever. And I love what Yeah Yeah says. He says, uh, Squints was Pervin a dish. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it's super hot, right? It's too hot to play. And they're all begging Benny. Come on, let's not play. Let's go swimming. I love how he says, okay, but you all have to raise your hands and admit that you wear your mama's bra and sometimes something like that. And they're all like, okay. And they all raise their hands. Well, yeah, yeah they were trying to get out of there. Then, then he says, see, let's put it to a vote. Anybody who wants to be a can hack it, panty waist, who wears their mama's bra, raise your hand. And in unison, all the hands go up. Right. And then there's another unanimous decision. I believe the line is pool honeys. Yep. So they wanted to go scam on the pool honeys. Which leads us to, I find this scene funny. And which one where Ham comes out and is strutting his stuff? The whole bit from the time they get to the pool to the time they leave the pool. I think it's heartwarming. And I don't know. I, I think it's charming. Your daughter being a lifeguard. How would she? How does she feel about that scene? Does she look at that scene differently at all? Um, probably well, haven't probably haven't talked about it since she's become a lifeguard. Yeah, no. So I, I'd have to ask her. Yeah, if some kid perved on her like that. Well, if he was like nine years old, would you have thrown him back in the pool and drowned him? No, she's she's eighteen. She can she can handle herself. Okay. She'd whoop some ass. <laughs> I don't know having all those kids in the pool. And we uh, are looking at Wendy Peppercorn and the sensuous clarinet music is playing. I'm thinking, I wouldn't want to get out of the pool now. <laughs> All right. Well, I just love how, was it, uh, Squints kept saying over and over again, all she does is smile and oil herself. Lotioning oil. and oiling. Lotioning and oiling. Oiling, lotioning. Yeah. Yeah. Over and over again, it's just like, wow. And then she just kind of gives us that smile every so often. And what was funny about this scene, and I noticed it when I first watched the movie, but I just recently found out, it was fucking freezing. Mm -hmm. It was like 50 degrees, and the water was cold, and when Squints gets out to get on the diving board and takes off his glasses, you can see his teeth chattering. Yeah, Yeah, you can. Yeah. Lips a little blue. But it looks like he's scared and nervous, so, you know, paid off. See, this is where, it's, it's moments like this in the movie where I think the internal dialogue really works i think it it helps the story be richer 
And one day it became too much for Michael Squins Paladorius, right? And that's where he gets up and he decides he's going to do something. Yeah. That the internal dialogue makes these moments richer. I like how they, t- they were saying, uh, I don't know if they're saying to each other, but he, he's going to the deep end and he doesn't know how to swim. <laughs> right. And so when he is brought out by Wendy and he's laid down and the entire team is there like, oh, come on, Squints. Come on. They're all saying, come on. And that fucking look. Come on. <laughs> at, at no time did anybody, I think, like any of the audience think, oh, this kid's in trouble. We all kind of knew oh, what yeah, was about no, to happen. Absolutely. Well, it's alluded to us that maybe because they're all saying, come on. But then when you get, yeah, yeah. Saying, yeah, he looks pretty crappy. Yeah. And, yeah. The, and then the other one, oh, God, he looks like a dead fish. Right. And, and they were all kicked out of the pool forever uh, that day. And, and doggone it, that smile of squints that he, that he gives us makes me laugh every single time. Yeah. That look is just so damn precious. Did, did you read the one instruction that the director gave squints about this scene? Keep your tongue in your mouth. He says, yeah, I don't want your tongue going anywhere else but your mouth. And then, oh, and we haven't talked about this yet, but the needle drops. The needle drops in this movie, right when that kiss is happening. Uh Uh-huh. This magic moment. My thought, too, when that kiss started, uh, it lasted a little longer than it should have. She wasn't interested. She didn't pull away right away. That's where your mind went? Yeah, I think she was kind of into that kiss a bit. Interesting. You didn't think so? No, not even a little bit. I didn't think so either. Oh, I, I'd say it lasted two or three seconds longer than it should have. Yeah, well, a dramatic effect. Back to the professor's point. Can we call them scores? Is that? No, those are needle drops. Okay. When you take a popular song that wasn't written for the movie, they are referred to as needle drops. Gotcha. Especially if it's just a, a little snippet. I've just heard you say scores enough times. I just wanted to use it on the podcast. No, I got you. I got you. But the soundtrack to the movie, um, like the 4th of July scene, for Uh instance, um, Ray Charles, America the Beautiful, uh, gets me every time. Well, sure. My dad loved... Needle drop. My dad loved all the needle drops in this movie. Him and Nana were just calling them out and like, who who sings this one? I know who sings this one. Yeah, yeah. Oh, so the the band that sang this magic moment also sing another song in the movie, and they're only used for when Wendy Pembroke Forth is on screen. Michael Squins Polidorus walked a little taller that day, and we had to tip our hats to him. And I love the way it ends. He kissed a woman, and he kissed her long, and good. I like how he. Well, he's walking along the fence with the kids walking in front of him, and he just kind of stops and looks at her for a little while, waiting long enough just to get that smile from her. Yeah, she kind of lightened up and realized, okay, maybe she's a little flattered now. And I like how he says that we were banned, but every time we walked by, there was a little smile. Mm-hmm. So and If you think about it, you find out later he marries her and all that. Uh, that's a great story to tell your nine kids of how you, know, you and mom kind of first kissed <laughs> yeah, I tricked her into it. Yeah. That, that's a great story. But he'd always had a thing for her. It's- well, that doesn't make it any less trickier. Yeah. Squints had Riz. Yeah, well, now it is the 4th of July. And I like this scene because I like the bit where they play baseball at night and it's, everything's lit up by the fireworks. Mm-hmm. I just think that's really cool. Having, having uh, the neighborhood out there, and I, I always think it's curious, why is... Maybe mom's inside because she came in to get something because he yells into the house, whereas the entire neighborhood is out on the street. Oh, yeah, maybe. So maybe that's what it is. She went in to get more of something. Sure. Watching ham go through, <laughs> grabbing pieces of food. Well, I think it's funny is that, uh, you know, some of them kind of want to stay at the food area. And nope, Benny's like, let's go. Time to go. It's, we've got a night game, man. This happens once a year because, you know, the sandlot doesn't have any lights. Mm-hmm. So they can't play at night. And baseball is life for. Benny, at least. Yeah, I think that's when you realize it, too. But, yeah, uh, Professor brought up a good point. I don't know why I find it so funny that when they're gathering the troops and they're all running into the sandlot and Ham is just stuffing his face with uh, just crushing hot dogs or he's grabbing cake and he's getting his pregame meal on. I love how he runs backwards to get some of the frosting. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That whole thing made me hungry. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, hot dogs, man. Mm -hmm. Come on. 
And I got to say that, you know, having the kids be in awe of the fireworks, I certainly remember that myself when I was 10, 12 years old. You know, seeing a, a big fireworks show was definitely awe-inspiring. It still is. Yeah. Even at this age, I think. so. Mm-hmm. It's fun to blow shit up. Yeah. That's my favorite pastime. The next day, they are at the field, and then another needle drop. Yep. Uh, same one from Get Shorty. Green Onions, I think is what it's called. And the rival gang shows up, the Greasers and the Socias, right? Yeah. What would you guys think of this bit? You could tell right off the bat that it's bad news because of the swagger of the music. They're all on bikes, and they're all wearing shiny, clean uniforms. Yep. Just kind of assholes, right? I don't know if I expected Ham to be the one to come out and start doing the whole back and forth. Oh, I did. I thought he was the leader. I thought he's the captain of the shit talking. I thought, you well, know, I figured he's the strong man of the team is kind of what the impression I got. Yeah. He had the best one-liners. The back and forth between him and Phillips, the captain of the socias, uh-huh. um, was priceless. Uh, ad-libbed. Yeah. Was it? Yeah. They just kept going at it. And well, he had the worst one at the end. Which the meanest one? one. Which one? Funny. You play ball like a girl. Yeah. So they decided that they're they're going to settle it on the field. It's on. But our field is what that dickhead says, because right? Because we don't want to play on this crappy field. Right, right. So we have the game. And God bless him behind yeah. the plate, smack talking. Oh, my God. So good. I got to say, I do appreciate this movie because there's so many sports movies out there that they get they build up to kind of this you know big play you know game with the rival team and it gets close and they have to win it at the end they have to pull it out no it seemed like throughout their whole game for this quick little montage is they're killing them they're just killing this whole other team and if you think about it this is really the only second real game we see mhm and real is in quotes so mhm but yeah, the shit talking was probably one of the best parts of that scene. I think one of my favorite lines was when he says, um, you know, if my dog was as ugly as you, oh yeah, I'd shave his butt and, and make him walk, walk backwards. backwards. <laughs> <laughs> and it works because they're triumphant and now it's time to celebrate. What do you guys think of this whole carnival bit? I got to say that uh, the first time I saw it, I was thinking this is not going to go well getting onto that ride. Yeah. And sure enough, it pays off in spades. Yes, it does. The best thing I thought about the ride after they get the chewing tobacco and all that is every loop around, you can see them a little more sick each time. Yeah, they do. And like they start that. all smiling, and then they start out kind of burping a little bit, and then their faces are going white, and you knew it was just about to happen. I can't do those kinds of rides. Even without the tobacco, that'd be me. When I was in college, I had a roommate who, you know, did chewing tobacco every day, and every day he begged me to try some. He really wanted me to try some. And I didn't smoke. You know, I drank a little, but I didn't do any kind of drugs or tobacco or anything. And so every day I would say no. Finally gets to about the end of the year. We're getting ready to move out, and we're kind of having a little party. And he says, will you try the chewing tobacco? I said, sure, why not? He got so excited, he scooped out a chunk of it, and he put it in my lip and everything, and I have never felt more sick in my life. That thing burned like hell behind my lip. Uh, I don't know if it was Red Man or whatever it was, but, oh, I will never do that again. Wait, can we go back to the part where he scooped it out and put it in your lip? <laughs> yeah, he, he actually he put it in my lip. I bet he did, buddy. Yeah, I yeah, bet he, he did. did. We get Smalls. What's Cha? You don't know what cha- You're killing me, Smalls. Another one. Another one. Big Chief. The best. It's Bertram who who brings it, right? Yeah. And who, ironically enough, ends up getting lost in the 60s. Yeah. <laughs> so. well, what I liked, there was that Gateway one. Drug. As they're going around, you know, all of them are kind of throwing up, and one of them throws up on himself. You hear one of them throw up, but you never really see what happened, except you hear a girl kind of scream. And oh, when she know, comes running up at and, the end. And when you see them all coming out, and what, what's his name's covered in, in puke. They are could, all covered. You can see her in the background covered in puke. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the tobacco was what? Licorice and bacon? Bacon, bacon bits, bits or beef jerky. Yeah. The next scene we get, Bill is leaving town for like a week. He's headed off to Chicago. And so he's, Scotty's the man of the house now. Right. And, and Bill kind of makes it a point to tell him that. And, you know. 
You're the man of the house. Yeah, and Scotty felt like that was a big promotion almost. He kind of was excited about it. Yeah, absolutely. One day, Benny hits the cover off the team's only ball, much to the team's amazement. With Bill away on business for a week, Smalls opts to keep the game going by borrowing his prized baseball autograph by Babe Ruth. Unaware of its value, he hits his first home run, sending it into the beast's yard. When the team learns of the autograph, they quickly buy another ball and forge Babe Ruth's signature on it to be a temporary replacement while they come up with a plan to rescue the autographed ball. Small suggests going to Mr. Myrtle's for assistance, but Squints insists Mr. Myrtle will not help them. The team attempts to recover the loss with various makeshift devices, but each attempt is thwarted by the beast. As Smalls prepares to accept his fate, Benny dreams of the spirit of Babe Ruth, who advises him to rescue the ball himself. Heroes get remembered, says the Babe, but legends never die. Follow your heart, kid, and you'll never go wrong. And so they, you know, it's just a normal day. He says it's, you know, a couple of days after their barfing fiasco and they're all feeling better. They go play ball. And this is what they call, or this is what the narrator calls an, an omen. omen. Mm-hmm. And they pitch the ball and Benny literally smacks the skin off of the baseball. What'd you guys think of this whole bit? I thought it was fun because they are in such reverence and awe of what has taken place in what is clearly a very rare thing in baseball. Didn't they say he was like the third guy ever in the world to do it? <laughs> Something like that, yeah. Bust the guts out of a ball, yeah. And everyone was in awe, and Benny was pissed off because they couldn't play no more. Right. He ruined the game for everybody, he says. You got another 98 cents? 98 cents for a ball. And Smalls is like, wait a minute, guys. I got a ball, but I got a question for you. Didn't Smalls have a regular ball when him and Bill were playing catch? That was, I, you know, I asked my dad the same thing about that is I remember he had a ball earlier. Fucking continuity filmmakers. Now it's possible, Come on. It's possible. They had been playing all summer and maybe he had brought that ball earlier in the summer. They could have used it. Could have been the one that Ham hit over the fence. Could have been. I guess we'll never know. So Smalls goes home, grabs a ball. We all know what ball it is. And they start to play again. And we don't necessarily... We don't necessarily feel bad that Smalls is doing this. We think, uh uh-oh, but Smalls should know better. The reverence that that ball is sitting in, in that trophy room. I I agree. He should know better. But on the flip side of that coin is he wants to fit in so bad with these guys. Yes. And and he he uses poor judgment. And he's right there. You know, they're, he's right there with all of them. So, Was there any question where that ball was going? No, no, no. This is a kid's sports movie. This was all played out for us. So there should have been no suspense. The biggest twist of this film was James Earl Jones opening that door. But we'll get there. But keep in mind that um, Smalls didn't really even understand the significance of that ball. Of not, course. So not even a little bit. He didn't know who Babe Ruth was. He thought it was some woman that signed the ball. I really, uh, I really appreciated the uh, the anxiety and the uh, the pleading that Smalls has when he's telling the guys that he needs to get the ball back. Oh, and also, <laughs> I loved Ham. You're supposed to turn. You're supposed to turn. Because he thinks he's supposed to be rounding the bases. Yeah. Yeah. Third base is that way. Yeah. <laughs> but Smalls is tripping. Right, he's like, uh, we got to get that fucking ball, and they're and everyone's like, no, dude, can't fucking do it, and he's like, well, he's can, pleading. Can we him. just go, you know, ask and squints? Nah, man, he's not gonna give you nothing. And then finally, they're like, what's the big fucking deal? And Smalls is like, well, <laughs> I, I stole the ball from my dad's trophy room, and now they have to get this ball back, or it's his ass. And so they come up with all of these inventive ways to try and get it back. I felt like it was a whole home alone kind of thing of coming up with these gadgets and traps and I thought it was well, maybe I thought it was very, very shrewd having uh Benny come up with we need to buy a ball right now. Go scrounge money. I thought that was very yeah. savvy. Go collect bottles. Yeah, because we, we, we just gotta temporarily put something there. That way his mom doesn't 
notice that it's gone. I thought it was kind of a, a nice call back to earlier on. Uh, the mom makes a reference. Are you going to go ahead and just play with your Erector set all summer long? And here he's bringing out the Erector set and he's playing with the Erector set to try to get the ball back. Yeah, he's got to. He's got well, to. Yeah. So there's a, the first thing that they try is they try the stick, putting the stick through the fence. And then that comes back all chewed up. And then after that, then they try uh, a pot that's, you know, that they can turn over and, and pull the ball back. And the dog crushes that. And then after that, it's the vacuum cleaners and they try all of these extensions onto the vacuum cleaners. I thought that one was the funniest. I thought it was inventive and moronic at the same time. This is where the movie gets a, a little ludicrous. Yeah. I like fire vacuum number one. And yeah, that, that was good. My favorite one though is the erector. Absolutely. Because they scoop it and they get it and there's so much hope and it catapults, but nope. The beast is going to snatch it out of fucking thin air. Well, I like eat, they they actually used the erector set twice, and both times after the beast stopped it, you see the erector set come flying back over the fence, crushed like into little pieces. What about the bit where they lower yeah yeah? If this is supposedly a beast, aren't they just like he's like a big piece of bait? Mm. And why doesn't yeah 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 has the fucking ball in his hand? Why doesn't he not throw it over before he gets pulled up? Captain hindsight. Yeah, well, well the one he's thing a pioneer. I, yeah, yeah, that's, that's right, because he invents the bungee jump. The one thing I appreciate, especially about this scene, is I, with each attempt and each time the beast got the ball again, you notice that ball got a little more destroyed, a little <laughs> more covered in dog saliva. saliva yeah. yeah, and so it got a little more gunky and kept thinking at some point, you don't even want that ball back. Yeah, well, I mean, could you imagine the value of that ball now? And Pro- all of the antics that they go through always ends with all of them yelling. Ah! Yeah, they all have that scream. They're yeah. all <laughs> through all of these, all of these. It always ends with them screaming. Right. And so nothing's working and everyone goes home and Benny has a dream and he is visited by Babe Ruth. The, well, the great Bambi. Smalls Ruth. and Benny has a dream, but Smalls dream, ha- I, you know, because usually it's the main character uh, who has the special dream that tells him how to do it. But no, it's Benny, kind of the side character, who has the dream that answers all the questions. I don't know if I would call Benny a side character. Well, though. I would say it usually it'd be me. the narrator, the one who, you know, the story is about, you know, kind of thing. Well, but it makes sense that Benny's the athlete. Mm-hmm. And so if Babe Ruth was going to visit anybody, it would have been fucking Benny. Yeah. It seems like Smalls is hyping Benny up the entire movie. Right. Um, to make him the hero or. What did you think of this dream sequence with Babe Ruth? I thought it was funny. Uh, I thought it was cute. The guy comes, uh, Babe Ruth comes out and, you know, Benny's got this problem. And But my favorite bit about this dream sequence is when Babe Ruth looks down and look at and sees... Henry Aaron's. Hank Aaron, yeah. Yeah, mm-hmm. and he says, I don't know why, but can I have this? And it's because, do you know why? Because he ended up beating his home run record. Yeah, Hank, Hank Aaron ends up beating Babe Ruth's home run record. Hammer and Hank. What did you guys think of this bit? I thought it was good. It, it, it gave uh, Benny uh, clarity of thought. I like how the ghost comes in. At first, he kind of has that 1930s look to him, and he slowly comes into color. And then as he's leaving, he goes back into that 1930s look. Yeah. I thought that was a clever way to the cinematography with that. Yeah. <laughs> Equipped with a new pair of PF flyers, Benny retrieves the ball by pickling the beast and leaping back over the fence. But the dog breaks its chain and chases him through town. Benny races back to Mr. Myrtle's yard, but the beast crashes through the fence and it falls on top of the dog. Smalls and Benny free the dog, who gratefully licks Smalls' face and leads them to its stash of baseballs. The two meet Mr. Myrtle who turns out to have been a baseball player and a friendly rival of Babe Ruth, having lost his sight after being struck by a pitch. He kindly trades them the chewed-up ball for one autograph by All the Murders Row and asks them to visit every week to talk baseball. So this is the bit, right? Benny wakes up, and it's because of this action that he's about to pull off, they name him the Jet. And he has had a dream. And he 
he knows what he has to do. So he comes out and he breaks out his special secret weapon shoes, which I laughed because as soon as he opened up, opened up the box, I said, oh, that's just a cleaner pair of shoes than he has on now. I was expecting him to have that like hallelujah music playing as the box opens up. Yeah. Hallelujah. And so he puts on the shoes and he tells everybody, I'm going to pickle the beast. What do you guys think of this whole pickle bit? I love the standoff with him and the dog just kind of staring at each other, kind of that old West standoff. Yeah, it was good. I, I really liked it because uh, you have uh, this presence that they both respect each other. The dog understands that Benny is a force to be reckoned with, and Benny obviously knows about the beast as well. And so, for the dog to, for the beast to to lay the ball down and say, "All right, what do you got?" What are we calling them? Needle drops. During that scene, um, it almost feels like a Wild West two cowboys standoff, um, ready to pull their revolvers. Fantastic. Yeah, and then you get the needle drop of wipeout. And the chase is on. Benny's running all through town, and he's got this big English Mastiff chasing him, and he's trying to outrun him, mm-hmm. and he's doing a pretty good job. They start out going through the alley. They they uh, they knock all the shit over in the alley. They go through the theater, and uh, after the theater, then they go through uh, looks like a Founder's Day picnic or something like that, the bit with the cake. You knew right? somebody had to knock that cake over. Oh, yeah. You know it was coming down, Brady Bunch style. Mm-hmm. And you know what the heck? Why are you running over? Why are you running up on top of all of those tables? Benny jumps up onto those tables and he runs down all those tables. He didn't want to run around the people, so he figured there's no people on top of the table. Uh, that sounds like sound logic to me. Me though, I would have stepped on a piece of cake or a hot dog or something and fallen right on my ass on that table. <laughs> it was the PF flyers. It, that's exactly yeah. what it was. There you go. Yeah. After that, uh, they ran by uh, the, the swimming pool, and then he meets up with the rest of the gang. Back to the sand lot. He's motioning for all of them to go back there. He does, or they do. And Benny, he jumps over the fence, and then this is where the beast, he crashes the fence. And crashes right through it. But the fence falls down on top of the beast. And I got to say, I got a little weepy at this part. I felt bad, and what it was is after they realize that the beast was trapped, it's when Smalls go, goes over there and starts trying to lift it, and he's like, help me, you guys. Absolutely. And none of those little assholes did anything. Except for Benny. Well, Benny naturally Benny, yeah. Because Benny has a heart of gold. That's right. But, you know, they uh, free the beast, who turns out to be Hercules, and he just starts looking on Smalls' face. And we know there, oh, okay, this is going to be all right. I love the reveal of all of the baseballs that the dog has collected. Yeah, me too. My dad first thought, he's like, oh, he's going to take them to see his puppies. Went, oh, no, I bet you that's going to be the baseballs. Yeah, yeah. And then Benny and Smalls go up to the door, and this is where we meet Mr. Myrtle, the great James Earl Jones. If your fence had knocked over, don't you think you might have heard it? Maybe, maybe not. Well, he starts off with, are you, so you're the kids who've been making all that racket. Yeah, yeah. I, I got a kind of a, a different question for you. After all of this is said and done, how come those little fuckers didn't help put the fence back up? Well, that was my thought is, did you just not tell him? Because he wouldn't know the fence fell down. Okay, fucked up right there. All right, good job. Um, but yeah, yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> they go inside. <laughs> And isn't it weird that it's only Benny and Smalls that go inside and the rest of them stay outside? Well, they're all still chicken shit. That, that's what I was about to say. No, they didn't even fucking help lift the fence. So fuck those guys. I, I think in just going back to, can we talk about how squints was just full of shit the sure. entire time? And I know they were harping on him at the end. Um, when he said, why rightfully you know, so, why didn't you just come over and ask? I would have got it for you. Yeah. Yeah, they, think, they all look at squints. Oh. But I think he just, he went on with that narrative and just kind of blew up their imagination um, for Mr. Myrtle and the Beast. Oh, yeah. To the point where, yeah, they were still. Yeah, they all trusted what hands. squints had to say. Yeah. And yeah. All I know is when that fence came down on that dog, you know, for one second I thought, this is about to get a zero if it's a puppy snuff film. And you also thought that Benny the Jet was going to die of some horrible cancer at the end of the film, too. So No, he's going to be shot in the Army. Well, oh, that's right. That doesn't surprise me. 
But at least his name wasn't Lou Gehrig or anything. Whoa, 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 guy. Shots fired. Yeah. I was going to say, though, Nam was right around the corner, wasn't it? 62? Yeah, mm-hmm. we get started there in 65. So that would have been. Yeah, these two would know. <laughs> okay, thanks. Uh, then he got drafted, good. but it was by a different team. It was by the, it was by the <laughs> Dodgers. That's a good one. We kind of already talked about this scene, but like I said, this is probably my favorite scene is this reveal of James Earl Jones' character and just how it all kind of wraps up. I love the bit where, you know, they walk in and he says, you're in trouble, aren't you, son? You can just feel it. And then Smalls tells him the story about Babe Ruth and he goes, oh, George? (laughs) Well, I just like how he said, oh, you're dead. (laughs) That too. You're not in trouble. You're dead where you stand. Yeah. Uh, He's got that blind man's intuition. Yes. Yes. Uh, He was almost a good of hitter as I was. I love that line too. So, mm-hmm. so I love that 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 deal he made at the end of you know you can have the ball, but you got to come back. Yeah. My thought was is that not only is he going to tell him where he got the ball from, but here's a you know our neighbor just happens to be a guy who played with Babe Ruth. To me, that would be a big thing. That's where I kind of was right. If you're Bill, you're like, wait, he played with Babe Ruth. Yeah, I'd push the kid out of the way and go to the house. I just wanted to see Bill collecting all different things from his trophy room, going over to get it signed by this guy. Or he would just take things from Mr. <laughs> Myrtle's because he can't see. Bill loves the murderer's row ball but still ground Smalls for a week for taking and ruining his autograph ball. Their relationship improves, and Smalls begins to call him dad. The boys continue to play on the sandlot for the rest of the summer, and several subsequent summers with the Beast, whose real name is Hercules, as their mascot. As the years pass, they eventually go their separate ways. Yaya enlists in the army and later develops bungee jumping. Bertram disappears into the counterculture movement, Timmy and Tommy become wealthy upon inventing many malls. Squints marries Wendy, has nine kids with her, and the two run the local drugstore. Ham becomes a professional wrestler, the great Hambino. De Nunez plays AAA baseball but later owns a business and coaches his son's little league team, the Heaters. And Benny earns the nickname, the Jet, after the word spreads about his encounter with the Beast. As an adult, Smalls becomes a sports commentator and remains friends with Benny, now a player for the Los Angeles Dodgers. Performing the play-by-play for the Dodgers game, Smalls cheers Benny on as he steals home to win the game, and they give each other the same thumbs-up sign they have shared since childhood. In Smalls' dugout, he owns and keeps on display the chewed-up Babe Ruth autograph ball, the murder's row ball, the forged Babe Ruth ball, some of Bill's pictures of Babe Ruth, and a large picture of the Sandlot kids from 1962. Roll credits. The so one thing about Bill, you know, getting over the fact that, you know, he stole the ball, still being a little angry, still grounding him on everything, you know, I don't know if it would have happened the way, because like with Joey and me, I've told him if he touches any of my shit, he's out. So Has he ever touched any of your shit? No. Never. No, he's never, he's not allowed to. He's never touched any of your shit. Well, I when, when I've watched him and allowed him to do it, yes. But if he wants to add, fire up a lightsaber or grab a sword, I need to be there. <laughs> of course you do. <laughs> and so uh, Smalls is grounded for a while, but they continue to play baseball for the summer, and we get the... We get a narration about how things progress over the next several years. Right. Well, the interesting thing is... Didn't they say in the beginning Smalls was either coming from or going to fifth or sixth grade? He had finished fifth grade. He had finished fifth grade, so he was going to sixth grade, and they played together all the way through junior high, so that's a lot of years for them. Sure. And then we get the uh, the summary of what we, the audience, learn about each one of the players on the Sandlot. Which, and then, and then it, it ends with Benny, which brings us back to present day. Did you know the actor who played older Benny is younger Benny's actual brother? Yeah, it's his older brother. Yeah. Which is funny, too. If you go look at the actor who played Benny and what he looks like today, he looks like his older brother. 
Well, that's weird because they're brothers. I know. Yeah. Isn't that crazy? Huh. Yeah. I believe Mike is a firefighter in Los Angeles. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Was he Benny Jr. or Benny Sr.? Junior. Junior. Well, most of the most of the cast they didn't uh, of the of the Sandlot group they didn't most of them didn't do much acting. Really, De Nunez and Benny they go on to Mighty Ducks too. That's right. Uh, but then, you know, not uh, a lot of those kids were in onesie twosies type of thing. Uh, the actor who played Ham, uh, he has now shown up a lot recently. Looks exactly the same. Uh, and he's pretty big on TikTok. He does a lot of stuff on TikTok, a lot of videos. He will wear the same outfits mm-hmm. and post them on yeah, social f- media. Oh, <laughs> Talking about uh, Sandlot and all that. Yeah. There are two sequels to this movie, but I can't remember which one. Only one of the kids from the first movie shows up in the second movie. I'll bet you it's Squints. Maybe. I don't remember which one. It is Squints. It's in the third one. Was oh, it in the third one? Yeah. The only cameo... Or the yeah, the only cameo in the second one that has anything to do with the first one is James Earl Jones. Oh, okay, that makes sense. Yeah. So but the third one does have Luke Perry. I like me some Luke Perry. R. I. P. Mm. So when we get the when we're back to the uh the present day and we see uh we see Benny in action on the field, I, I thought that was a nice way to end it. Sure. Did you see the number Benny had on his uniform? Three. Yep, he had three, which was Babe Ruth's number. Yep. And then we see Smalls' kind of booth where he's doing the commentary, and we see probably millions of dollars worth of memorabilia just hanging out there. Did you catch his hat? Yeah. I thought I for sure thought he would be wearing the hat that Benny gave him, but no, he went back to the fishing hat that he was supposed to burn. Uh-huh, because uh-huh. that's who he was, right? Mm. And then the camera pans up, and we get the picture of the boys. And I guess my question is, why is it in color? It was taken in 1962. Did they have colored cameras back then? You know, I think they might have because I've looked at some of my parents' older pictures and some of them are in color. All right, let let me rephrase my question. It would have been kind of a... Why does the picture look like it was taken in 1992? Yeah. So... I think you're looking for plot flaws when there are none. Oh, he, he. Oh, the the biggest, uh, Angus, the biggest <laughs> plot flaw in this motherfucker is baseball. Okay. That you are not going to convince me you, on. So, you want to know? That's just like your opinion, man. You want to know? Hey, and opinions are like assholes. Everyone has them and everyone's stinks. You want to know what the biggest flaw in this movie is? Oh, please enlighten us. When they go into Mr. Myrtle's house. And he's got the lights on. Why would he need the lights on? Whoa, 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 dude. Why do you keep picking on the blind people? Look, you have our guest shaking his head. Like, what the fuck is coming out of your mouth there? I love it. (laughs) And that was the Sandlot. Welcome to a new segment we like to call... Face the Wheel. Face the Wheel. Face the Wheel. Face the Wheel. The premise is simple. I will spin the wheel, and whatever category comes up, John and Don will apply it to the movie that we are reviewing right now. Once they have presented their idea to me, I will decide the winner of this week's wheel. So, here are the categories. Mashup. Plot. Rename. Genre. Reboot. Fuck it. I liked it better when it was called... Spin again. Pick any. Add any character from any movie. And here we go. What's the category? Mashup. That's the one I wanted. All right. Uh, The premise is simple. Mashup a movie with the Sandlot. You got one? I do. Um, I think you did on a previous podcast. Do you have to change the genre or? No, you just mash up the two movies. Okay. Um, And and the second movie doesn't have to be one we've reviewed. It can be any movie ever. Okay. So. Um, I thought it would have been kind of funny, um, specifically during the scenes where they're trying to fetch the ball over the fence with all of their equipment to mash this movie up with Honey, I Shrunk the Kids. (laughs) Um, just adds another layer of 
shit to their plate um, because not only are they trying to get a very valuable piece of memorabilia back, um, they're also ant-sized. Um, so there's there's my mashup. I like that. That's good. Honey, who shrunk the sandlot? Yeah, maybe. Maybe. You got one? I got one. Do you want to go next? No, you can go next. Okay, so what I'm going to do with my version of this movie is I am going to mash it up with another well-known baseball movie and add a 40-year-old to the team and call it uh, The Natural Sandlot in that we're going to have a bunch of these 11- and 12-year-olds playing with a 40-year-old who unfortunately lost a lot of years and now trying to get all of his years back in baseball and wants to play because baseball is life. I'm going to... I'm going to take uh, the professor's look of perplexity as a ray of hope. I am going to mash mine up with, so the kids are playing baseball one day, and instead of the beast being over the fence, uh, when they hit the ball over the fence and they go over and investigate, they find an alien who's just trying to get home. And so since these kids don't have any way of uh, transporting said alien, they enlist the help of the Socha baseball players because they have bikes. And it is, in fact, they are trying to get E.T. back home. So the Sandlot and E.T. I thought you were totally going in a different direction when you said they go over the fence and there's an alien on the other fence, I thought they were going to hear that little predator sound, and the predator was going to hunt and kill all the kids. As as I said, alien, I I had a choice to make. They were either going to find E.T., or they were going to find a couple of face huggers. Mm. I wasn't quite sure. So, All right, so we have the Sandlot with Honey, I Shrunk the Kids, and they get shrunk down. We have The Sandlot and, John, what was your other movie? Oh, The Natural. The Natural and have a Robert Redford in it with them. The 40-year-old dude with a bunch of boys. <laughs> and then we have The Sandlot with E.T. Oh, let's see here. Well, there you have it, listeners. I have a decision to make, and I think that this week the point is going to go to Angus. Oh, for fuck's sake. I could see E.T. actually being a player on the team. He was going to be the ninth member on the team. And instead of saying, ouch, he says, out. Well, as the, <laughs> and as the ball is heading towards the fence and it's not going to quite make the home run, he raises his finger and it just pops over the fence. Yeah, there's that too. It writes itself, Don. It kind of does. So I I just, on your I'm, side. Pre- I'm pretty sure I just got screwed, yeah. but that's all right. That's all right. He's the guest. Thank, thank you for the win. Uh, I'd like to humbly say I'm undefeated, and I will be announcing my retirement. <laughs> well played, Angus. Well played. And that concludes this week's Face the Wheel. Face the Wheel. Face the Wheel. All right. What do you guys think? You guys ready to rate this flick? You know, I'm ready to rate this flick. Angus, are you ready to rate this flick? I'm ready to rate this flick. Comic book guy, you ready to rate this flick? You don't have to smack the skin off my balls to get me excited for this review. Hey, Professor, how do we do our ratings? We do our ratings on a scale of one to five fucks. Five fucks is a movie that we think is cinematic gold. A one fuck movie is a movie that you watch it once and you're thinking, I'm never watching that again. And what's a zero? A zero fuck movie is where you get done watching it and you turn to your buddy and you say... Oh, for shit's sake. What the hell? Why would you make me watch I want one hour and 41 minutes of my life back? Or in other words, we just don't give a fuck. Uh, Here at Three Guys, it is customary that we give our guests the first option of going first. So, Angus, would you like to rate this flick first? Absolutely. Um, Keep it brief. Um, I think I love this movie because I feel like you don't have to even like baseball to enjoy this movie. Um, I think most of what I like about this movie is finding friendship, fucking around, uh, being dumb asses as a kid. Um, resonates with me every time I watch it. Um, and for those reasons, I'm going to rate this five fucks. 
Cinematic Gold from Angus. Don, thanks you for being so succinct and quick. I pulled this out of the Bronco helmet. I suppose I will go next. You suppose correctly. You go next. Thanks, buddy. Uh, The Sandlot. The Sandlot is a lot of fun. I enjoyed the characters. I enjoyed the story. I enjoyed the setting with the boys and growing up and playing sports. I could totally relate to that. It was like one of my summers growing up as a kid. And it's just a a very nostalgic take for me. I think the story is very well paced. I thought the needle drops were very fitting. I thought the score was very fitting. If it weren't for the fact that it's baseball, I would be giving the Sandlot five fucks right now. But because of my feelings on baseball, I am giving the Sandlot 4.75 fucks. Fucking A. That's fucked up, but I'll take it. Yeah, well, I mean. All right, who wants to go next? Would you like me to go next? Sure, why not? Okay. But before I do, Don, I I believe you've been doing pretty well lately on guessing what my rating is going to be. You want to give it a try this week, see if you hit it out of the park? Sure. I think you're going to give the Sandlot three fucks. Final answer. Final answer? Okay. I'm going to go ahead and start with what the positives I saw in this movie. First of all, the nostalgia. Sandlot captures the essence of childhood when kids actually played outside all day. I also felt that this movie was relatable uh, in the fact that the characters, it had such a great diverse cast and they had characters of all types, which was nice to see. It's a heartwarming storyline, lots of humor, and it's very family friendly. Now regarding the negatives that I saw to this movie, the plot is pretty predictable it basically screams the dog will get the Babe Ruth ball and hijinks will ensue. It's got very simplistic conflicts. The, kid, the kids seem to go above and beyond what it actually would take to solve the problem. For example, like was suggested, just go to the neighbor and ask for the ball back. Or, you know, try to coax a dog with a treat or something. There was a lot of, seemed like a lot of simpler ideas they could have tried. Uh, there was also a little bit of a lack of substance to the movie. A lot of movie, a lot of this movie to me felt like a plot of a TV series more than an actual movie, and it really had strong Wonder Year vibes. I even had to go look up when Wonder Years was kind of popular to see which came first, this movie or Wonder Years. And Wonder Years actually came out in 1988, so I feel like they may have taken, especially a lot of the narrator ideas from Wonder Years. The Sandlot is, as I said, a nostalgic tribute to the carefree summers of childhood before computers, cell phones, and the internet. The film's authentic setting and heartwarming story are bolstered by the strong performances from the young cast. The chemistry of the cast infuses the movie with genuine charm and humor. However, this movie is not without drawbacks. The plot, while endearing, follows a predictable trajectory and relies heavily on familiar coming-of-age tropes. There's pacing issues in the middle sections that may cause some viewers to lose interest. Additionally, the characters, though lovable, can be somewhat one-dimensional, and the women in this movie are also widely portrayed as, gee, they look pretty, and nothing, not much anything else in this movie. While the nostalgic depiction of the 1960s is appealing, it prevents an overly idealized version of the era, glossing over its complexities. The the exaggerated portrayal of the beast and other elements sometimes border on more cartoonish than anything else. But then again, that's also part of the charm of this movie. It's an adult telling a story from his childhood, so of course he won't get all the facts right and definitely exaggerate some of the details. Despite these criticisms, The Sandlot remains a beloved classic thanks to its timeless themes of friendship and adventure, capturing the magic of childhood in a way that continues to resonate with audiences. It's for those reasons I'm giving Sandlot 3.5 fucks. Ah, fuck off. I threw up the five at the end, 3.5. Yeah, I know. You're pretty good at that, though, I will say. 
Yeah, yeah. That's what makes these ones kind of a kick to the balls. About halfway through the podcast, I changed it from a three to three point five. Oh well, there you go. So you you were reading in the it. range, in the range. But I, it's it's he uh, is my Tyler Durden. I've decided. I, I like how you know it. You, your opinion of the movie went up the more we talked about it because you could see things that you didn't see yeah. going into it. You talked that up. surprised me. I was low balling it. Yeah. So. All right, I guess you're up there, guy. Yeah, I suppose you're right. The Sandlot is a movie that I have watched many times with my family, and it is associated with summers uh, at the beach, and it's an easy watch for all of us to sit down and do together. It's, it's a very fond movie for me. The characters, all of the kids, Squints, Ham, Yeah, Yeah, all of them. I, I love all the kids. They're great. And the, and the banter that they have with each other and, and the back and forth and all of the uh, hijinks that uh, we see these kids, you know, talk up when they talk about the beast, when they talk about, you know, how great or how bad somebody is, is so much fun to watch. And I really, really dig the needle drops in this movie because they're on point. Nine out of 10 of those needle drops, you know, I just, I, I go, oh, that's awesome. It, it, it just hits that point just right. Having Scotty being the awkward kid that we see him settling in is also uh, better with the sub story of him and Bill and the fact that they do eventually grow closer together. It was uh, a delight to have James Earl Jones in the movie at the end. His character, like I said, I, I love his delivery, how he talks about how much he loves baseball. The movie overall doesn't feel long at all. It, it moves along at a good pace, and despite the, the hijinks that you get when they're trying to retrieve the ball, it gets a, a little uh, outrageous when we get the vacuum cleaner scene. But other than that, I, I enjoyed the rest of, of all of their, uh, all of their shenanigans that they tried coming up with to get the ball. Each one of these characters is so much fun to watch because they remind me of kids that I knew of in elementary school. And it think, and I think that they just, uh, show, uh, a, a real bond with each other. And it, it, it it comes across on screen in the story as well as in their faces when they're talking to each other. I think that this movie is um, a fun watch for uh, any family that wants to sit down and watch a bunch of kids being goofy with each other. I'm giving this movie four solid fucks. Four solid fucks from the professor. 3.5 fucks from the comic book guy. 4.75 fucks from yours truly and cinematic gold from our guest Angus. But with the three guys average, that will give the Sandlot an average of 4.1 fucks, which now puts it in the 11th spot tied with Jumanji. Welcome to the jungle, big fish and Spider-Man. No way home. It is slightly better than V for Vendetta. Dodgeball, Zombie Land, The Thing, Edge of Tomorrow, Clerks 2, and The Batman. And it is slightly worse than Thor, Love and Thunder, Top Gun Maverick, The Breakfast Club, The Big Lebowski Scream, and Casino Royale. So there you have it, boys. Not too bad. 11. Are you hating us now, Angus? Yeah, absolutely not. That was incredible. Solid ratings. I was little uneasy coming into this so well why did you think we were gonna hate it um I, him for sure i thought he was gonna hate it well it's tough for me because as you guys know there's two kinds of movies i'm not big fans of war movies and sports movies you don't like war movies no i don't like war movies don doesn't either really no. not a huge fan not Saving a huge private fan. ryan we we did it i yeah. i like you know i i appreciate the acting i appreciate the cinematography i appreciate all that they just lose me. I'm just not a fan of them. If I had to choose between that and any other movies, I would always choose a different movie. Hey, Saving Private Ryan is in the ninth spot here at the Three Guys, so that's not horrible. Yeah, that's I true. mean, we liked it. It's Spielberg, come on. But I could see why you hate him if it was like a Pearl Harbor. Mm -hmm. 
All right, that is going to wrap it up for this episode of Three Guys in a Flick. If you would like to know which movie we are going to be reviewing next, please check out our website. Uh, Speaking of which, hey, John, where can they find us? Fuck if I know. All right, that's good. I just want to thank Angus for coming out and hanging out with us. Did you have a good time? Absolutely. Thanks for having me, guys. Yeah, no problem. Would you do it again? Absolutely. All right, excellent. 100%. You got another movie in mind yet? Um, waiting for the Batman two to come out. Oh, you got a couple of years out, but we will definitely yeah. put you in for that one. Um, you guys haven't done Django, have you? Not yet. It's in there though. I think, I think you put it have. in there. So yeah, yeah we- I might've went on a bender one, one night. And I also want to thank anyone who listens and who has requested a movie. If you keep listening, we'll keep recording for three guys in a flick. I'm Don. I'm John. I'm Ken. And I'm Angus, a.k.a. The Great Hambino. Three guys with some mics, yeah, dot into the flicks. We're here for the real talk, no time for the tricks. Don is the captain, steering us right, can drops, now to shed light. John with the comics, bringing the hype. From the good, the bad, to the absurd, we break it down, make sure you heard. Passion for the screen, we ride or die about movies. You know we always give a fuck, no lie. Angus is thinking, you know what? Can I have those so I can just listen to them when I drive home and shit? People who are listening would probably say, are they doing fucking Stand By Me again? Wait, did we have we done Stand By Me? Yes. Yeah. Okay. You sure? That was a good yeah. one. Yeah. Oh. Why are you looking at me like that? I'm, of course we did Stand I'm By Me. I'm getting old, bud. Or have him just cut out all the good shit. To I'm, keep it down on I'm time. good either way. Don't get me involved in your <laughs> bullshit. Coward. It's your fucking show, man. What did you think of that? I think in that moment, uh, it made me think of the podcast. Uh, Smalls kind of reminded me of Frodo. Um, and Benny as Aragorn uh, lifting the fence. That is a great lead into Precious Moments for this week. I know. Look what happened you. to Precious Moments? Well, we can get into that later. What happened to Precious Moments? I'm pretty sure you're the one that said you didn't like it. No. Uh, I, I just disagree oh, with that. That's the reason? Oh, yeah. Wow. That, that's uh, After I came back from the bachelor party? Yeah, that's what it was. Yeah, that's we'll get we, into it later. That's why we we'll get into it later. The, yeah. I, okay, going back to what you said earlier, I, I appreciated Precious Moments, so don't blame me for killing it. But it's your fault. And did you notice that for all the time we had precious moments, we fucking never did Lord of the Rings. Ask a quick question. No. All right, guys. What you just did? Yeah, that's true. Can so I ask there another? you go. Is it that time? I think it's that time. What do you got, Ken? Nothing. Nothing. What about you? Let well, me guess. You have two. Can we go to our guest first? Would you like to share what porn names you have come up with? I didn't want to slander the great classic film, The Sandlot. So instead, I came up with some porn names for the podcast. Oh. Oh. <laughs> Fucking fire away. I'm curious. So I've got three guys and a side chick, three guys and a dildo, <laughs> three guys and a clit flick. Those are the three you got for us? That's what I got. All right. You're up there, guy. Why am I? Why don't you just go first? Okay. Uh, slut slot. And... um. The suck slot. And, oh, no, no, I'm sorry. The sex slot. Bam. Nailed it. I actually have three. Of course you do. And they do get better as you go. In fact, we, we will be the judge of that, but please go ahead. So the first one I thought of was what you put, already said, which was the sex slot. Then I came up with the sandy clit. And then I thought, why did I think of this before? Twat. The sand twat. Or the sandy twat. It, it works miracles. You could say, uh, wait, wait, wait. Did, you just, did you just say it works miracles? Yes. I feel like uh, just to put yourself in it back in fifth grade, you know, getting uh, money for baseball or Pokemon cards, or I guess in your guys' circumstance, it was well, comic books. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't, yeah, comic books. Yeah. Didn't right? everybody steal yeah. out of their mother's purse? All right. May all of your uh, days and nights be filled with happiness. All right, fuck off. Good night. Um, the suck slot. And oh no, no, I'm sorry. The sex slot. Bam, nailed it. I actually have three. Of course you do. And they do get better as you go. In fact, we we will be the judge of that. But please go ahead. So the first one I thought of was what you put, already said, which was the sex slot. Then I came up with the sandy clit. 
And then I thought, why didn't I think of this before? Twat. The sand twat. Or the sandy twat. It, it works miracles. You could say, uh, wait, wait, wait. Did, you just, did you just say it works miracles? Yes. I feel like, uh, just to put yourself in back in fifth grade, you know, getting uh, money for baseball or Pokemon cards, or I guess in your guys' circumstance, it was well, comic books? <laughs> <laughs> Didn't, yeah, comic books. Yeah. Didn't right? everybody steal yeah. out of their mother's purse? All right. May all of your uh, days and nights be filled with happiness. All right, fuck up. Good night. Three guys in a break, keep the passion alive.